do today. Uh, so we talked about multiple sequence alignments and uh, both how to make them, how to use them to find more remote homologs, and also how to use them to find other patterns. We can use it for uh, pattern finding or for machine learning methods, etc. There is a related area where, where also multiple sequence alignment is very important, that's phylogeny. So basically finding not only the alignment between sequence, but also finding how they relate to each other. So phylogeny is from the Greek word uh, phyla, that means group. And uh, so the two relationships of groups, something would, would mean in Greek. So how are groups put together? So how, how do you two things together, put things together? It's basically, it's partly it's, it's computational, it's related to what we call clustering. It's totally very, very brief about um, unsupervised clustering. You want to put things into groups that are related, but phylogeny is somehow related to that. So that you want to group things together. So there are a couple of papers I, I printed for you about it. So this is basically, you want to find a tree. So and a tree, we know what a tree looks like. You can look at the window. It starts with a trunk, and has branches, and then leaves at the top. So the idea is somehow, I mean, this is a basic evolutionary idea that you have a tree starting here in the, uh, some species here that somehow divide different species, and then it divides more and more species. Some disappear and die out, but some continue to live here. So this is some old tree that's from plants. Probably it's a uh, small, uh, small cell lowers and other ones. So, and, and, and so basically, we want to know what we want to, how these genes, so these species, so these organisms relate to each other. So, we should think about some basic evolutionary steps. I mean, this is basically what we do when we do the alignment. And, uh, of course, we know that you can change amino acids, as I said. Time can be tame. You can even have the reversing, so you can be. Uh, time can be emit, or emit. In the least, in the least, some things you can do. Time can be de, de to dr im, or even in searching, in searching, in third letters you can t emit or dr im. So there are all things, gene fusions, etc. And normally you would assume that genes, so that this, this is like how, how gene can change. And some of these, particularly there are two types of nucleotide changes. The ones that change the amino acids are the ones that do not. And certainly you would expect that if you know, the proteins are the ones that act and do most of the uh, functional parts or in a cell that is, if you don't change the amino acid sequence, that will not affect the cell at all. So, we, um, uh, so synonymous change will be uh, less disruptive and mo most likely have no effect at all on the organism. While if you change the nucleotides to the change the amino acid, that could have a effect. And also you say, expect the gaps are probably more disruptive or more changing than, than or gaps and insertions than Mutations. But what we know from the substitution matrix is that some changes of amino acids are less uh, less strong than others. So we have, uh, but there are also other types of mutations or, or genetic events that can happen. A very common factor is gene duplication. So you have one gene that becomes two genes. So there is a basic idea from well, from the 70s where, where this say if you have two genes that do the same well, at the moment the duplicate are identical and that of course can have an effect on this particular because you have suddenly you have twice as much of this uh, protein in the cell than you had before so that of course something if you increase the levels of protein in factor two that certainly affects the cell. On, on the other hand, the, the idea is that at least if you have two genes, at least one of them might evolve to get obtain new functions, or you 
it might have a sub-functionalization of it. So one does one thing better, and another one does another thing better. So in time, they might diverge to different things. You have things like gene fusion. It's basically two genes that fuse together, which has happened many times in evolution. I guess it can be split also. I mean, genes can be self genization so you can have a gene that doesn't work at all anymore. And there's also events like what you can call horizontal transfer. So basically, a gene comes from another organism. It's quite common in bacteria, but even in uh, has occurred in other organisms. You can think about an RNA virus. Basically, you have a gene that comes from something and it moves into the genetic material. It's less common in a uh, multicellular organism, but it's, there are evidence that it has happened also. So all these things can happen. And of course, the basic Darwinian idea is that they happen randomly in the, in the genome. Equal, uh, more or less equal rate. It's probably not true that it's always equal rates. There probably are different rates, but at least more or less it's a random mutation. And then there's a second step, <coughs> which is the selective step. So in, in there you have selection. So you have after mutation happens, I know these have mutations, you have uh, it can be positive, so in one the offspring of this organism can be better than the than the parent. It can be negative, it can be getting, so basically it's worse, that's, and, you, or, and it can be neutral, it doesn't really matter. For a long time it was kind of a big discussion if how common it was to have, really it was in how many of these mutations were negative and how many was neutral. And it is quite clear that there's a large fraction that at least in a rough sense are neutral. There are cl clearly many mutations that are, do not have a big effect on, the, on, 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 um, uh, on the fitness of an organism. So, so just by time passing by, you can uh, see that you accumulate mutations. So you can use particularly some genes that are not under very strong selective pressure. You can use a kind of a molecular clock. So you have one mutation on average every thousand years or something like that. Uh, the other big event here is speciation. So basically that you have um, Suddenly, one species that suddenly becomes two species, and so species are <coughs> always, as always defined as <coughs> two uh, uh, organisms that cannot have that do not normally have viable offspring. So, that, so basically, the, that the speciation can happen both because of the genetic they drift away, so the genetic don't match each other, but it can also be made by physical separation. It's quite common, so like in, you have. Uh, the uh, turtle, Darwin's turtle, turtles that are in different islands, they start being different because they live in different islands and never see each other. Or the things, the, the, the birds also. Okay, so in the, uh, if you look at the gene, or the, in the gene family, uh, so basically you have you can think about you have negative or positive and, and, or neutral selection. So, you have neutral. so basically this is kind of background frequency, how often does an amino acid or nuclear like change happen if you have no selection at all. And you, you, you can, so if you look at the geno genome, you can see that uh, the parts of the genome that are not in genes have much higher evolutionary rates. So if you take compared to mouse and human, you look at how mutation happens, it's so in the genes it's much less than they are in the non-gene regions. So that's kind of a definition of what is a functional part of the genome. Is it, if you don't have any selective pressure on it, if you don't have nothing really matters if you have a mutation, then uh, uh, you would say that it's, uh, that, that it's not very functional. So there's also many, many, many genes, many parts of genes that are, have a negative selection. So often you have, you have much less mutations. So that's basically it. most things that we do to a protein might destroy it. Many things to do. There are also rare cases where we find positive selections. Basically, this is my actually that you have genes that evolve faster than expected. So, and, and, and the expected background here of measure by this ratio between uh, mutations that are uh, changing the amino acids and the changes than the, the, the ones that do not. They are called KAKS. So you have a fre fre frequency of mutations that change amino acid, and the compared to the frequency of I mean, mutations on DNA level that do not change amino acids. And if that ratio 
is highest, you have more chance, more changes than you would expect by random. You would call it you have a positive selection or adaptive evolution. So if you look for these genes, there could be genes that are very important between organisms. Yeah, so there are, I had a friend who worked on uh, looking for these genes, and he uh, found, for instance, something that separated grizzly bears from polar bears. And there was a couple of proteins in the eye because of course the light conditions are completely different. So like there was a drive for the polar bears to have uh, uh, to have uh, that protein evolving faster than expected by chance. Because it was really, really the ones that had these mutations survived better, had more ki more trees, more, more offspring. Okay, so you take all these things together, and then you want to make it, you, you, so you can calculate this mutation, I think, and you want to put it into a, to a tree. And normally, so basically you, you can take two proteins, or two genes, and you can calculate some kind of distances, and you, then you want to represent as a tree. Normally you think of a tree like this, so when you up, down, down, you have a root, and then something has happened here. So this is a tree based on bird similarity, so this bird, yeah, you can change the color of the bird, you can change the size of it, or the head of it, or the, pe uh, the peak of it, or legs, they are different, so they are like that. But normally, we, if you think about this, this means that this was the original bird. Then it has evolved, and are, so these are the birds we see today. We don't see these birds, because they have died out, because they are parents that don't exist in yet. So actually, we don't really know what was the root. We often know that there's <coughs> some relationship between the different birds that we see today. Then maybe you can figure out which was, or which was closest to the root, that this one was closest to the root. So you yes, can expect the root to be here, or there. And that often you need to have an external source to calibrate, or you have something that is, you know is far away, you see what is closest to that. That could be the input of the root like that. So, so, but these are actually both three streets are in principle identical except for this line here. So that they draw in different ways. They are, because all the distances should be the same. So sometimes we draw trees like this, and sometimes we do it like that. But this is actually, if we needed to root it, we needed some extra information to say where do we should put the root. So we could have put it down here, so that was the beginning one. If you don't know that, we, we have a problem. Okay, so let's uh, start actually with some trees the uh, evolutionary effects that we are should have in the back of our mind. So this is a tree of life. So frog here, mushroom here, some things here. You can see here as I said the first there are three major one, two, three major kingdoms here. But basically just basic basic facts are life started maybe four billion years ago. That. So quite early in Earth history, I mean, Earth is not more than maybe four and a half, five billion years ago. I mean, this is basically the ocean fall. So it didn't take a lot of time to get some some kind of early life. Uh, so you have everyone. What is the early? How do you know this? When you, you have some old fossils, but it's actually quite difficult to separate the fossil of some early life. And for something that we might just a chemical reaction, it's not, it's not obvious what, what is what. So that it's not so the exact time here is hard to say, but it's probably the case. Yeah. The awesome ideas are that maybe at least three and a half billion years ago they have photosynthesis, and two and a half billion years ago is most people believe this is from the last universal common ancestor to all life on Earth. So that, that's so two and a half more or less. A billion years ago we had one or a group of organisms that then uh, was divided into these three kingdoms of life. So remember the, where these were? So the, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukaryotes. And then nothing happened for two billion years. And then suddenly it came to an explosion. We got animals half a billion years ago. They had a fungi. But already so it was a long, long part here. And you had, you moved up the land, and we had vertebrates and dinosaurs and uh, flying birds, etc., etc., etc. And there was even the, ri was the sudden rise of oxygen here about 200 million years ago. 
So the idea somehow, and nobody really knows how life started, but I think one idea that people have is that somehow you can just have some kind of hot springs or some parts that were a bit warm, there was chemical reactions and you had some something that, that had energy in it that could form simple uh, 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 life forms. And then the idea is that you had actually that RNA would be the first kind of molecular molecular, molecular life. The main reason for this is that um, uh, RNA is probably only macromolecule that can both uh, self-replicate and act as an enzyme. So you could imagine that you could form RNA and replicate it. And then you could make some lipids or something that includes them, and then actually you can have the genome that has, you can have some kind of primitive cell that could replicate. And so later, this RNA made DNA, and the DNA took over as the genetic material. But this is a little rough idea. One supported this idea is what was called the Miller Urey experiments, I guess it's from the 50s, where basically they try to simulate or emulate the early uh, conditions on early Earth. So they made it uh, seawater and heated it and produced uh, water vapor. Uh, and you did uh, put some electricity there and you let it cool down, etc. And then at the end you actually found some organic molecules here. So they found some organic molecules can be formed by pure chemical reactions that are just basically heat and well, heat and water and, uh, and some uh, basic fundamental uh, mm, uh, chemicals. So they found at least amino acids and uh, they are found. So they did, somehow you can start that. You know, of course you don't start in life in these experiments, but something, some basic life Molecules could be there. Okay, so let's the basic phylogeny is the tree. As I said, you can have basically uh, rooted tree and non rooted tree. So this is a tree of finches. So this is uh, probably Darwin's finches. So a birch that looks different. This is a vegetarian one. I don't know if there are any uh, carnivores, but well, they probably are. A warbler, the cuckoo finch, the woodpecker finch, a large tree, a medium tree, and a small tree. I guess that depends which tree they live in. So they are all look, so if you're a bird watcher, you can look and see the difference between these. I cannot. But they, so this is one of, the, like a, one of Darwin's findings, was really to categorize these into different groups. And they, basically, they're, they're different species, so they don't really reproduce. They're probably mainly separated by the living in different habitats. So they, don't, they don't see each other, it's mainly where they are. But it's hard to say which one was the original this. You can't say really that the small ground piece was the original one or what it was. When you can, it's, to determine that, you would probably need another finch that is not related to any of these that, and find wh which one is what is the closest place for that in this tree. So that's what you have here. Uh, I guess you have another type of uh, 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 birds here, the kiwi and the emu and the moa. Some of them are extinct. And here you have that the rhea is an outgroup, so this is you can call an outgroup, so this is more different than other ones. And you should put the common answers to the root of the tree, you put between that one and everything else. So if you have an outgroup here, you can put it like you get a tree like that, and then this kind of falls into place. Uh, the slide again. So yeah, here we have some of these finches, they see they look very different. This is a big one. And as well, for that evolve differently because they eat different things. Uh, so this is normally how you represent the tree, but also, so what does this tree really mean? Of course, it means that these two are quite close to each other, 
a little more closely charged than these two, and these two are more closely charged than these two, and there are some, and uh, you know that these branches are shorter, so that means they are more close to each other. So somehow you would expect this to mean differ, to determine some kind of time or distance. So how many changes do you have happened, or how long time ago was it that these two separated? So if you put, why do you put this here and not here? That would mean that yeah, this ideally it would be some kind of measure of time or at least distance. So ideally you would say, okay, these two separated only 10 million years ago, and it's 20, and it's 60. So this length of the branches actually represents something. And of course for DNA or for protein sequences, it's quite easy because we can, we can get measures. We can say that this measure actually is 5 mutations, or 10 mutations, or 100 mutations. And if at least if we assume some kind of linear model, we can actually um, get this, even these times. It's not that we know that from that in the exact times is a bit difficult, but at least we can calculate the number of mutations. This one is, is, is easy. But the, the result might be actually like this then. So you have, it, if you do this, so here you have actually six mutations. So here you have three, here you have one, or two. So that means, you see here, that, that doesn't mean that you have. Um, uh, so if you draw, draw a tree like this, which is probably which is correct, see, so this is a uh, full representation of, of, of the tree. All the birds do not end up on the same uh, line. And this is because, or certainly, this, if these are birds that live today, this, this is the same amount of time that passed from this branching for this bird and this bird, because of course they all li live today. But it could, but it doesn't mean that it's the same amount of mutations. It means that they can of course be uh, uh, this one had, had more mutations than that, that one at the same time. You can, when, when we try to make these trees, of course, we, we can estimate it. We can, we can force a tree to, be, to look like this. So that we have the same time as that. So we can this. You have here some time measure, and you try to do it. Of course, it might not be in, in, in as good agreement with the data, so we see the data we have, but we can force it to be like that. Or we can let it be like this, if you want to. Uh, so, when we, make, when we want to make a tree, we have to decide what type of tree we want to make, how, how easy this is. In principle, when you think about a tree, as a, if you want to make basic description tree, you can define it as, as splits. When do two species separate, or two genes separate, duplicate, or something? What happens? Splits. So basically, and that is kind of the key concept. So what the, often is okay. What is the most common ancestor to the C? Of course, the C line here. So the split here between C and C line. On. C and C. I guess that should be this one or this one. But then, the, then this group has separated from the raccoons and the bears and the dogs earlier. And the bear, but the bear is more similar to the raccoon than dog. But you see here it's a very small difference. This time pass here is very short. So it's not a big difference. It's almost a like three-way split. And of course the problem here was we we when we make these trees, we'll talk a little bit about how to make these trees later, but when we make them, it's not as certain, it's not, I mean, it's not, it's actually computationally quite difficult to find optimal tree. So, and uh, of course the data is a bit noisy, we need to, based on alignments, that can be wrong, etc, etc. So it's not always that we know that the tree like this is very, it, it really has to be that, it's, it's just one that's of maybe many trees. So often what you do is to, what you do is called bootstrapping, so you divide your data into different ways, so you do make the trees in different ways, and you may be uh, like 100 trees, and you study how often do I find this split here. So this split here is found in 100 out of 100 trees, but this one is only found in 50 trees, and this one is 50 trees. So that is probably not very reliable. So it's difficult to say to be a very small to the raccoon or to the log. So that is only 50% chance to find that. But it's clear that the sea lion and sea dog moves related to each other. And also here you have, it's not obvious where the weasel ends up here. So maybe it should be. Maybe it should be, the, this one should maybe go up here or something like that, but it's a bit more evidence for that than the other these things. So the, often you see these bootstrap numbers, and sometimes there are 
Number of 200, something like that, number of 1000, depends how many different trees you made. So, if you have these, these trees here that are not very reliable, so if you only take things that are over 90, maybe like that, you end up with, or over 75, or over 75, I think, you end up with a tree like this. So, basically, you say you can't separate these three, but you have a 75 and 80 separation here. So, you say we don't, we put them like three way split here, because we can't separate them. Okay, so, so far we talked about mainly about splits of trees of uh, uh, species. So basically, this is a dog separating from a bear. But the data we have is often from genes. So we, we, we can take one gene from a coon, one gene from a bear, one from a dog, and then look at how different they are. So these are homologous genes that we find with blast or something like that. But there was also this case of gene duplication. So homology can exist in many ways. You can have homology between genes that have been duplicated and also between genes that have been separated by species. They are all homologous. And there are two, two different words for this that are, that are important to know. It's called orthologs and paradogs. So orthologs is, the, is, is a direct comparison between my gene that I have with the mouse gene. That are once when the mouse and I had a common ancestor, they were the same gene. So orthologs are genes that are separated by a speciation event. So if you make a tree for my genes, most the, the separation overlaps with the separation of the species. While paralogs are genes that are separated by gene duplication events, basically the gene duplication event. And the idea why this is important is because, as I said before, is that if you have gene duplication, the idea is that you can have more functional vari variation, but, but speciation for still the gene has to do the same thing. So the idea is that orthologs should have more uh, higher functional similarity than the paralogs. It's not there, there has been some studies of it, and it's it probably is like that, but it's it's not extremely strong. Uh, it depends how I do things. So to figure this out, you need to do, consider two types of tree. You need to uh, consider uh, species tree and gene tree. So the species tree in this case we kind of know. Human, cinnamon, the chicken, and then the, the, the frog, and then to tell that is. And the, so you have a species tree. So this is really from fossil evidence or from our knowledge of animals or from other genes. We can figure out the tree for that. But then you take one gene family here, and you actually have one human. In this case, you have two human, three human genes even. And you have three chicken genes. But only one center person. One. So if you make a gene tree, it will look like that. So in this case, you would assume it may would be very unlike. Uh, uh, this, if the three human genes were had evolved after the split from chicken, they would most likely be most similar to each other. But now they are now it's almost like chicken one, human one, chicken one, human one, chicken one, one, three. But um, the center plus one, so only similar to one, so the human one, and the cat plus the also. So that means that the duplication must, or the duplication actually must have happened somewhere here. Or most likely it happened somewhere there. Because, uh, because chicken and human uh, both have three copies of this gene, or three homologous genes, that are most similar to each other. And there's also a another application that happened over here in Arthenia. So, as I said, this is an important concept that the homo homo homologs, do you know what it is? Orthologs are similar sequences in two different organisms that have arisen due to speciation events. They are they were just the same gene but in two different species. Orthologs typically retain the identical similar function even throughout evolution. Paralogs are similar sequences within a single organism that have an access to a gene duplication event. Uh, this one can skip synologs. This is basically if it comes from another organism. That happens, but we'll, that's yes, a very big complication when we do, do the thing. So you can look at it like that. 
you have, if you, this is a species, A is species B, and you have here, you have one gene alpha that becomes two genes alpha, and then one becomes alpha beta. So in the time of speciation, you have <coughs> alpha B and beta, and in species A, they are maintained there. But then you have another application happening here, between so species B and three of them. And if you remember, the things are lost. So, um, yeah, so this is just, yeah, this is just kind of what happened here. You have a gene duplication event. One, yeah. There, one there, and one there. No, there's a gene duplication, a specific event, and a gene duplication event. Uh, So, well, this is just another description of the same thing. Basically, have, uh, these are parallels, these are autologs. And one way a common actually, database to find these autologs is to use what is called, uh, uh, is to find clusters. So this is a database called COG. So, you go to the by department, you find a COG database. And what they basically, basically what you do is you find clusters of autologous genes. So you take one species, one genome, and then you find for gene A here, you find the closest homologue in species B and species C, and then you do that for every species. And as long as the closest homologues are the same, you will assign that these are autologues. So you find these clusters of autologues. But you also have uh, exactly where you have gene loss, for instance, so like can also happen. So, however, if you if you do, if you do so look at this example, so this is examples I had before, basically not exactly, but almost. You have four species, uh, A, B, and C, and D, and in C and D you have two copies of the gene, alpha beta. So it was a long time ago. It was. Uh, uh, the application that, that form gene 3 A and B, the gene A and B, and then it was speciation, so you form two genes, so two species, but then in one of the species, beta was lost and one species A was lost. So the, here, this, when the, this piece of A and B was formed, they only kept one copy of it, when well, this one they kept another copy of it. So actually, in this case, you will get a tree that looks like that. A, so A alpha will be more similar to C and D, and B will be more similar to C and D. And um, so if you look at these genes, you would actually say, okay, you say that these are uh, you would think that A is more similar to D, and then B is more similar to D, particularly if you don't have these. We get a species tree that looks like uh, like this, which is wrong. So the species tree should be look like that. So A and B are similar, C and D are similar, but at the end you end up with tree that actually says A and D are more similar, and B and C are more similar. We should look at different genes in different cases. So these kind of loss and gain of genes is a complication. So there are people try to put this all together, have advanced models for modeling all this together, but it's not that easy. But the, 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 so the idea is basically to try to, to boost the species tree and the gene tree at the same time. So back to this example here at the beginning. And then you say, okay, I have probability to have a duplication here, happen here, here, and here. And then I have losses in some cases. And then I have a three species three that has both things in it. Well, if you just remember that uh, all similarities are not homologous. So this is two proteins. The active side of two proteins, I guess it's a protease or something like that. Uh, they look very similar. You agree? But uh, 
if you look at the structures, they look like that. Not as similar. So these are clearly as that in this case, there the is a uh, non-homology homology similarity. Uh, so, so basically, in this case, the chemistry is reproduced, uh, but has evolved twice independently. So, if you take a typical genome, or a, well, well, a typical, oh no, my, my genome, or human genome, chicken and uh, fish genome, and you look at, ha, so how are the, all the genes related to each other? So, there is a really like, I mean, you can do this for yeast or bacteria also in general, but there are not so many duplications in these cases. But there is a set of maybe almost half, but maybe a bit more than one third, where you really have one copy in uh, uh, each of these three genomes. So that are really, you have one Essex gene in uh, uh, each uh, of these. So yeah, they're really core orthogs. There are a few more that are maybe exist in two copies in one, but they are really quite clear, quite so maybe applications. And then there are some sets that are subsets that are similar to each other that are not found in the third one, but there are things that... And then they have a lot of pr pr proteins that are homologous to something else, but they exist in many different copies and different things, and it's not clear which, which, what outlooks there are, and it's not really clear if they do really the same thing. There's almost one third of it. And then there is a small set, or maybe 10%, that are unique to each genome. So there are, you don't find any well, similarity to any of the other genes. So, the, so there are, and uh, the reason why this, this here is based on modules is that because it's duplicated. It's not that these things are, uh, as you have, some families have expanded very much in some genomes. So like, if you look at the smell receptors, the GPCRs and the smell receptors, which are my, I think the mouse has five times more than we have. But we have actually lost most of them because we are not very good at smelling. The mouse is much better. So they have 600 and we have 150. And the dog also, of course. So, they are, so they are, there, there's a large turnover of genes that are activated and non-activated in, in, in organisms. So, in phylogeny, what we try to do is basically trying to figure out how these genes and other species are related to each other. We're trying to find the evolutionary history of it. There is just this thing I briefed over before that is actually complicating things a lot. And because really we have the species, we want to know what is the common ancestor. And the, not, not only what is the common ancestor of uh, all the uh, organisms, but also what is the common ancestor. What is, how we, do we know what is the common ancestor of um, humans. I mean, it's not obvious that you have what is the most similar other species to us. It's like, for a long time I think people would have voted for the, for the gorilla. But really, it's very clear that the chimpanzee is much more similar. So really, how do you take into account uh, um, how, how do you know that? I mean, that's the physiological differences between gorilla and chimpanzee and human are basically, I mean, well, there are some similarities are probably more to chimpanzee than to, gor to gorilla. But if you do a genetic search, it's clear that our genome I mean, are clearly more similar to the chimpanzee than to gorilla. Or I mean, if you do it, uh, the classic example was the panda. So in the, uh, in the panda, uh, is it more similar to, I mean, it looks like a bear, but it doesn't hibernate. I might only eat bamboo, but that's a little so strange. But, but it was really, so it has some features that are more raccoon like. Although those are these kind of red pandas, I think that there's a lot of pandas, but that's a big black white panda. But, uh, say, uh, there was arguments that it's more like a bear or more like a raccoon because it doesn't have an eight, but it looks more like a bear, etc. Et so it's not an obvious thing. But if you do a genetic tree, you can quite clearly separate them from 
each other, and it's clear that it's something in the order of, I think, I think, if I remember the numbers correctly, they were separated 40 million years ago, and was 60 million years ago, they were separated the raccoon and the bear. So they are, so that, and this is what you do that by ha making this fermented cheese. So after the break, I was thinking about talking about time to tell you a little bit how to make fermented cheese. So, any questions before that? I will try to give a quite brief overview of Faliasic methods. This, I mean, it's, you can make an entire course of it, so it's, it's, I will just try to classify the different methods when I do. And um, in principle, you can, you can divide them into two different groups well, distance based ones and cladistic ones. And here basically you make tr here basically you try to have a tree and you see how well does it fit the data then you can change the tree later and optimize the data and you can use, do, do it using maximum parsimony or maximum likelihood here basically you try to make a tree and the same thing at the same time uh, so the distance based ones are probably easy to understand so i start with them so assume we want to make a tree between four genes in this case, and let's have a distance between every pair of genes. So basically, we start with doing, if you remember when I talked about plus W, we start there making a, a pairwise compared to all sequences. And then we have, a, we can get some kind of distance. We can measure number of mutations, it's easy. To distance. It's like one mutation is distance one, two mutations is distance two. Of course, if you have too many mutations, you might have mutations that happen twice, etc. But for small number of mutations, that's an easy calculation. You can do it on DNA level, proton level. But there are the other distance measures that you can use also. You can use the distance in the some kind of blossom way, etc. You can do some randomization, etc. Doesn't really matter. But we can measure some distance between, between genes or between anything you want to do. And then, if we can find a tree, that exactly explains these distances, th th then we're going to call the, this an additive distance matrix here. So and what I mean it explains is that the distance between A and C here is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 steps. A and C, B is 6. See, going here is five, 5 distances there and then 1 there. So the distance is really how far you travel in the horizontal axis in this case. So the distance between D is 6, 7, 8, 9 to C, and it's 10 to B, and 14 to A, in this case. So it, but oh, clearly, these distances might not fit, there might not be a tree that fits the distances. If this would have been 13, we couldn't have made a tree that fit the perfect. So in most cases, when you have it, you don't have trees that fit perfectly, but you can try to make as good tree as possible. Because if it is 13, well, this one should be one step up here, but then, we would, then, then that one would be, like maybe you could have made it, then one would be, have to be one longer, but then that one would, should be one shorter, so it doesn't really work out everything else. So you could, so there are, the perfect uh, additive is not, that thing exist. But if we set approximations, you can do that. Well, let's see. If even better, if all the branches has the same rate, so that all the mutations happens at the same frequency, exactly the same frequency in every branch, you would have a tree that either all these things end up at the, at the same position here vertically, also, because then they would be. Uh, I mean, we, 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 we compare genes, we always, always compare genes that exist today. And of course, it's not, it's not a, such a bad assumption of like, let's look at decently related things that, I mean, the mutation rates are similar for all these, these genes that we compare. I mean, that's certainly not true if you compare very different genes or for, or for very, very long time scales, maybe. But if you compare 
a gene in chimpathy compared to a gene in human, I think it may be sort of bad assumption. So then you would like to have a tree that looks like this. Of course, then you would have to have a matrix, this one matrix that fulfills this. So in this case it does, A and B has one, two, A and C has one, two, three, four, five, six, B and C is the same, and D has 10 to everything. So that would be a perfect tree <coughs> to find, to, if you, that would fulfill, but if you had this piece of matrix, that would be perfect tree. Of course, it's quite unlikely to have exactly this, um, this would be a nine, that you would make it, it would work. You would have to have, it. well, you can still make it three, but it would not fit perfectly. So how, how can you get to these trees? So one, one idea would be, I mean, if, you, if, if you had these distance matrices, I mean, if it's perfect like that, of course, it would be kind of intuitively, as we did in class W, to start with the closest distance here, so A and B. So this part, if you only have two, this three is obvious, how you make, well, you can make it, maybe some different way. But. And then you would take, somehow, the average of A and B to the next one, the next number here, so you somehow would calculate the average A, B, this does everything else. So you add, like, one new part every time. And uh, well, in this case it would be C, but it could have been that C and D were most close to each other, and then you would have, have the average distance in A and B together. But really, to remember here, the important thing is really is, so it's launched is this, this, but this is the splits, so the nodes, because that's really how we define a tree. The lengths are important also, because they tell you how far things are, but they are, uh, but they are just represented by some kind of time or distance event. But really, if we would have a tree that had C and D here, that would mean that C and D are more similar to each other than C are is to A and B. So that's a completely different topology of a tree. So one method to do this is called a Fitch method, after the guy who developed it. So in this case, let's have a tree here, A, B, C, D, E. So we have five uh, different genes. And uh, yeah, this doesn't mean this that are like this. So 5, 5, 7, 7, 4, 9, 8, 10, 9. Let's see if I get this right now. So in this case, you will take the sh shortest distance, which, which is here, is between A and C. Uh, so then you define A and C to be, to be one group, one cluster, you can call it, so what, 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 one part of the tree. And uh, you know that distance between A and C is 4. So do you know that if you have a tree here, that B1 plus B2 should be 4. And then the other genes here belongs to another group, and that's called W, and AC should be belong to X here. So you should have some distance here, B, W, that is the distance from average distance of A and C. But you don't know if this B1 and B2 should be similar lengths. So you know that the lengths should be together should be four, but you don't know if A is more similar, or W is more similar to C or to A, but because they, they can have different rates. So you calculate uh, the distances from A to everything else, which is five plus nine plus eight divided by three, because the three areas. You get 22 thirds, or 7 point something, 7.3. And the distance from C to everything is 6. Because uh, <coughs> it's 5 plus. Uh, let's see here. 5 plus 7 plus 6. Uh, then, then you can assume that the lengths B1 and B2 are should be um, half of the distance that should be what 4 plus the, di the difference is basically the difference between these two distances here that turned to 2 thirds, so that's 8 thirds for some reason, and this is 4 thirds and half of that. So you should have 8 thirds distance here and 4, four thirds difference there, so in total, total this length is 4 but it's uh, longer this one than that one. Of course, the reason is because A is on average further away 
from uh, the others than B is. Then the next step, you calculate this. Um, you have this group X then, which is basically the average of A and B. And you can calculate, uh, or A and C, sorry, A and C plus X. And then you can get a new distance matrix from this average here. Uh, well, this is x, which is basically this a and c, this x is here. So you distance from that one to everything else. And you can get the distance will be 5 to uh, b and c, and it's 8 to 7 here. So then the closest distance now is x to b, I guess. You have x here, and you have b there. Oh, you don't that here. And then you have y, which is the outgroup, which is t and e. So y is then the two things that are left here. So you have three like that. And you can calculate the difference between x and y, and x and b. And in this case, uh, this is seven and a half. This is uh, b and y is further away. So this one is set, and then you can do the same kind of formula here, and you get to say that this this b was further away, so this one's longer, and you can even estimate the length here between these two, which is half, I guess, or minus a half even, uh, and then you have estimated this one, and then you have finally you have one thing here that you need to resolve, which is the estimates of y which was d and e. So how does, and then you can keep the saying there. Can I ask yes? What is, a, what is a negative number in this case? Yeah, a good question. <laughs> well, it, it, see, let's see how I got this negative number. That's, uh, well, you want to estimate this b4 here. For some reason, you, well, so you have, the, this is here, well, it doesn't mean, I mean, it's just a distance measure, it doesn't really, really mean anything, it should, it shouldn't be negative. But it's, uh, it is so that uh, we want to have this distance 5 from x to b, and we want to have the distance to y, which is d and e, should be, B this is to x to b should be five x to b should be five x to y should be fifteen divided by seven and a half. So this this should be five. This should be seven and a half. But the distance between these two between b, these two groups is actually uh, eight and a half. No, nine and a half. Which I guess you should be able to solve. Yeah, okay, I understand that you can do the algebra and it comes out. Yeah. But what so how can I interpret the negative distance in this one? It doesn't. You know, it, it, it interprets that, that, that the tree is not really perfect. I mean, that, that tree doesn't describe all the data. But basically, and I guess you should get it. Uh, I mean, it's just that you can't get a tree with this method that actually fits the data better. That doesn't mean. So it's, it's, but I but I think you should be able to have it. This should be five. This is three and a half. And it should be five. So this should be one and a half. So you take the average between A and C. So there's an extra. Oh yeah, you should go or there. Yeah, yeah, but this should be. Five. I don't even really get it. Yeah. I don't know why you, you should be able to get it. Yeah. So this is basically three. You, I mean, then you do for the last one here. You're three four. So in this case, actually you should have a tree that I think it should probably reproduce everything you had. Um, yeah, uh, the, this is the tree you get and basically you, you can get all the arrows. Uh, so these are the distances you get and this is the arrows you have, if you remember, I don't remember the first one. So the first one you have 5, 4, 9, 8, 5, 10, 9, 7, 6, 7. And you actually make a tree that has the distances well, 5, 4, 
nine seven, I guess also so like so the errors are uh, I mean it's not perfect, it's five point seven. Then five so it's not a perfect match, but it's quite good and I don't know what this error IA means really. One third. Okay, yeah, okay, this is one third is is what it is exactly what it is. So here it should be nine, it's eight point seven. Eight point sixty seven. And uh, here, so so this is the errors you have. So particularly A B distance is not perfect. So you have an error estimate here, and this is well, this is the distance you got. So this, or you had this negative distance. I don't really know what you would interpret it as. Uh, but well, well, it doesn't make sense in an evolution term. It's just a way that you can. Uh, I don't think you can end up with it. But. Well, this is the same thing again. I have a question yes. to, the, mm -hmm. to the very first matrix where we started for the calculation for this. This? Yes. Uh, here. Um, what, do the, do, what does the numbers mean in the matrix? So this is uh, some kind of distance ma measure. I mean, normally you would calculate this in number of mutations, for instance. Okay. So you would take, I mean, particularly if you load on DNA lab, you say based on, but it, it, it could be any other m distance you can measure. So I mean, it really depends where, but number of mutations is typical, or, or percentage of mutations of that. But it's any kind of measure that distance is. I mean, you can, you can do it for structure similarity of proteins, you can do it for physiological similarity of the animals. Uh, I mean, so you, you could think about any measure, that is, 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 but normally mutations, will, the number of mutations is a. It's a good, I mean, that's what you would do with genetic methods. I mean, and it works quite well when you have few number mutations. So you don't have lo lo very bad alignments. If you have a good alignment, you only have like a few mutations here and there, then, then it kind of is a good measure. If you for much more distant things, it's much more difficult. That's right. This is basically, the skip from it, the same, same thing again. Uh, similar idea to features basically what's called neighbor joining. This is an example where you basically take the closest. I mean, the same idea. It's you take here, you have A, B, C, D, and your distance is 7, and then 4 to 16. So A and B, now A and C are most similar to start with. And you can click, then you make a new node here, and you kind of make some measures there, and you can get, then you get, so you put A and C together. I don't know what it is. No, sorry, B and C together. And then you get, then you then to a new matrix. Where uh, the new new U that you create here is most similar to uh, C, so you put that and then you put D and the H. That's the same idea. It's just okay. So, so the, the, both this neighbor joining and the fish method. I mean, basically, you, you try to basically take the closest ones, you calculate the new node, and you may somehow measure the distance of that new node to everything else, and you add, keep on adding one thing at a time. They have some problems sometimes. There, for instance, if you have very long nodes, they kind of always get uh, mis uh, misplaced. And uh, so, if you have very, very, one very long branch that is very long, it's hard to know exactly where you should start. So there are better methods, and uh, but they are often computationally much slower. So, in maximum parsimony, the idea is that basically is that you start with a tree. So you have a data here, and, and then you try to fit the data to So this is your data. This, in this case, you don't have distances as the data. You actually have the sequences. And then if you want to make a tree that best, actually minimize the changes in the sequence. So in this case, the difference is, you think was fundamental is that all do I have, I mean, the distance between this is one, two, three. And the distance between this is also one, Two, three, I guess. But here, you see, this this one changed here, and this one changed here. So it's only one change that could explain all these three. So if these two are together, you can explain it by one change, not like uh, two two differences of three, because you, you, you don't want to say word word in the sequence of things change. So to start with, is that you start with some kind of example tree. It may be made from from the, and then you can there are different trees. You can find the best one, but somehow you have an example tree. And then you ask the question, how well does my data fit this tree? 
and I do this for each column. So if I have this tree, and then I can generate a method to generate new trees, so I can have entire different trees, so I can, I can change the trees, something like that. So here I have the species, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. I have the characters here, so the sequences. So I only look at the first column here. So how can that, so then I would have T, C, T, T, C. So how can I find the minimal number of changes, permutations, that, that can explain this absurd pattern, T, C, T, T, C. So here, of course, something was a change, because T and C are different. Now T, C, T, here. So this one has a T, and this one has a T. This one has a C. So the minimum change for these three would be that this one has mutated only once. You could think about that you had, so maybe you had a T here, it's still there, it's still there, but here it's mutated to the C. You could also think about that you had uh, another, I mean, you could be in a C here and mutated there, and mutated here. But that's, that's, that's two changes, otherwise you only have one change. So for the first position, you could think about, if you could do that, you have a T and C. So you, if you would start, with either a C that oh sorry B I was wrong I I I did not the right order here after it again but so if if you had a T here start with T you can have one mutation here that explains everything or you can start with T and you have one mutation there that changes everything so it's only one mutation could explain all these differences of these spe these five species. I haven't opened the right order before, so I was confused. So that means that you have one mutation, so you can have like one mutation in this three, and you go on to position two, and you have a change. There you have alpha has an A, delta has a C, gamma has a C, so you have A, C, C, A, A. So if you had an A in the road, you would uh, have two changes, one in delta and one in gamma. But then if you had another tree that where this one may come from here, you would only need one change. That would be well, that tree would fit this column better. Uh, or you could have two changes here, or you could have one change here and one change there. They all have two changes, and all mutations can happen twice. I mean, these are two changes there. Then if you go on to slide three, you will say that you can explain about one mutation here or one mutation there. And to slide four and five, you can have changes here, here, or there, there. They are similar. They the same pattern, but just. And slide six, you need to have only one mutation here. So, so slide six, you can be quite certain about that it has a, has a, a you know, T in the root. So then you can just sum up all these changes in, along the tree. And you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So nine so so, so the whole the, this tree, this particular tree, that's just one tree out of many, uh, explains the observed data with nine mutations. Then I can try another tree. So let's see, uh, I want to try the tree here with the delta there instead. So how much, would that be a better tree or not? So if we back up, we assume that this one is here, this is position one. No, this is position six, sorry. So if I had a tree like that, it would still only be one, so I have one. If I had a tree like that here, uh, I guess I can still, I still need Two mutations, I guess. I guess I can have a mutation happening. Maybe even it's three mutations like this. No, I can still have one happening behind that. So I have two more, so three. And then three plus two, two plus two says five mutations. This three doesn't really matter here because the sharing is happening here. So that's another one, so that's six. In this case, I could uh, have the tree like that. I only have one mutation, so I only have one. So that's, I have seven. In this case, I, on the other hand, well, it wouldn't matter at all either. 
so that would be seven. Or eight would be eight, so that would have one shade. So that three would fit the data better. Let me see if I can draw it from the board. So basically, I, I, I can try another tree and see if it fits the data better. It might be another tree that actually fits even better. Mm. I, I can also do this. This is a maximum partial one method, so I have to try to find the maximum change, minimal number of changes. There's also something called maximum likelihood, so you can have different probabilities of different things to happen. And you have another method finding it, you can sample it more in a probabilistic way, in you know, a this deterministic way. That is even slower, but it's often more accurate, at least for in many cases. But in the all is basic sampling. There are also methods that actually can take uh, this problem we had before about this this type of trees. So you can have a maximum likelihood model that has probability of Duplications and of uh, speciations and I uh, know you have a species tree. Uh, duplications and then of gene loss and gene etc. So you can have a model that actually tries to optimize all these things together, but it quite easily gets quite time-consuming, and they all, this method only work when you have very good alignments. You need you can't uh, basically have hardly any gaps in alignments. It works fine if proteins are 90% identical etc. As well, and often you even do it on DNA level, but then, then it's very useful. And one of the first, as I already mentioned before, one of the first uses of these kind of trees was to solve this giant panda riddle that I was come to in the second. Yeah. So, so there, there was, you know, I don't know how big a riddle was for my time, but it was at least one. People under uh, wondered where the giant panda belonged to in the phylogeny. That's something that's was maybe not clear from studies. I expect it was to look like bears, but have features that are unusual bears and typical raccoons samples do not hibernate. So in 85, so this is uh, before the genome project, of course, but it may quite late because of course we know about DNA structure for 30 years earlier. Uh, and uh, sequencing methods were starting up here, so at least you, could, you can do some sequencing. So they basically took, I guess, things to the ribosomal, and the small ribosomal subunit. That's a normal way, one of the normal genes used for, for phylogeny, because every organism has a small rib, uh, ribosomal subunit. And you just look at that. Another common part is the mitochondrial DNA, I mean, not for, for, for eukaryotes. Because so you know that the mitochondria has the, its own DNA, DNA, and it's quite small, so that's a good thing to see. And it's also good because they have. Uh, uh, you have many copies of it in the cells, so you have more of it than you have a nuclear DNA. But then you do that, and uh, you get a tree like this. Quite reconciled, and when you have, this is some, they have, use them more like a molecular like clock. So you have some a pro idea that you could calibrate the number of mutations you get per million years, per year, while to have some fossil evidence, you know some things about it, so you can, you can get some rough estimates of the time. These are always a bit, not, not that exact, but they are often plus minus 10% maybe. And you see that brown bears, like grizzly bears or brown bears are the same thing, uh, and polar bears separate maybe one or two million years ago, so they are, they are actually quite si similar. The black bear, which is a smaller bear, maybe five million years, there's something also called a spectacled bear I never heard about. That is 10 million years ago, and then you have the giant panda. So it's very clear that the giant panda belongs to the bear family and not to the raccoon family, which is raccoon and the red panda. So the red panda has nothing to do with the giant panda. So this is somewhere quite likely during this period here, between 20 and 10 million years ago, is when the bear started hibernate. I would guess. So if you take a parsimonious approach, because they, they, all, none of these hibernate, but these do, and they should have evolved there. And, uh, I have no idea why, but that's 
could be an interesting project. Or maybe someone else. Another of these classic examples was also that was with 6 and S R ribosomal RNA. So if you take the small subunit of a ribosome, and you did that, and this is really Carl Rose and George Fox, that went out to, to lakes or it was strange, strange ponds with very warm water, and found some sp organisms living there, and uh, they. Uh, uh, Sequence the 16 S ribosomal RNAs, please. And you find this, you find these three kingdoms of life. You find like archaea, prokaryotes, eukaryotes. You find archaea. You knew we had the bacteria and then the eukaryotes before, but you find one thing that clearly is a third separate line. So, of course, people were called archaea because peop these guys thought that uh, the environment that found it in is very archaic, it's very, very old. So it looks like it's, the earth could look like a time ago. But it's nothing archaic about it. They are really uh, they're really just one third part of the life of Earth. But they also found an extreme environment. So basically they have many aspects that are similar to those. So basically particularly the genetic transcri transcription translation is more similar to eukaryotes. But in other cases, they, are, they don't have a nucleus, just sing, single, then, so that makes it harder. So this is basically, if you make it fully in three, you would have something like this. I think I show you in another side. You have the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukaryotes. And here, of course, you have the animals. For instance, animals are quite similar to yeast. Do you know that? We are... Uh, very similar. This is to your life. That you can go into and look at. I think yes, you can click on. So this is another. This is not not why it's still root three, but often often actually plotted a bit like circle like that because it makes it quite easy to read it. And of course, <coughs> we know that there are a number of uh, events here that are transfers like that between uh, certainly between Ikea and within Ikea. We know that at least there have been tw twice a transfer of genetic material to the eukaryotes. We know that. At least the common theory is that the mitochondria is uh, independent bacteria that was living within other cells. So it was an independent organism. So we know that mitochondria still has its own genetic material. Most of it has been moved into the nuclear genome, but it's still is. so most of the mitochondrial proteins are coded in the human genome and uh, in the nuclear genome, but some parts remain. And the chloroplast is also in plants, so it's the same thing. It also happened with plastic that was moved into the chloroplast and become on. on uh, so the chloroplasts at least have been moved also as, as their own bac small bacteria uh, that was up, uh, taken into into a big cell and then brought photosynthesis into the plants. So photosynthesis in green algae and in the, in the plants didn't evolve separately, although these two I think are very separately in the in the um, evolutionary tree. And then within the bacteria there's been a lot of horizontal transfer. There might be some viral transfer between eukaryotes also, but that's a bit harder to detect. Because I thought of just finalizing this lecture by asking we, who we are. So a little bit this is probably this is more popular science, but people are about popular science, but this is somebody in my mind one of the major Findings from uh, the genomics projects is that really how do we uh, we have figured out much more about ourselves. Certainly, people claim that a lot of diseases and things like that have been solved and cured, but that's still just a handful and probably not that uh, gigantic. But it's really the understanding the human ori origin of uh, uh, it's clearly would have been much harder without genomics. So of course, uh, this is something that's been fascinating for at least a couple of hundred years, for since Darwin's time, or even before that probably. And uh, some of the key concepts is, I mean, we, we, we know a lot of it before, it's like, because one key, key concept question was, who is our closest living relative? So is it what, what, what are the, how are the primates relate to each other? And then we know that the 
Det måste vara verkligen det closest dead or extinct relative house is the, is the Neanderthals. So it's another humanoid living in mainly Europe. And, and uh, uh, how did that, um, uh, how are they related to us? Um, are they just a subspecies or a really separate species that did we intermix, etc.? Uh, how are we related to monkey? Uh, Where did we origin? Is that unclear? Clear. And, uh, and how close related are all, all humans to each other? So let's start with humans, chimps, gorillas, and the primates. It's clear that we are most similar to chimps or gorillas. What we mean from you know, physiology and from we have thumbs that we can do things like that with, and no other monkeys have, and another uh, brain size, whatever you want to look at. And from that, from sequencing, you have a quite clear picture that you have. Uh, it's actually gorillas that are the out group. So the gorillas, the so humans and chimpanzees are more similar to each other than uh, the gorillas are. So this, this is some rough estimate of the time the separation was. So there was some, some common answer to all three, but maybe eight million years ago, and then there are five million years ago, which was something like the hippies and the, all the humans. For some reason, you find many more fossils of us than you find of chimps and gorillas. So there are many more, much better data here. It is because they all look the same, but it's also going to be that we have also expanded much more. We have chimpanzees and gorillas basically stayed in Africa. So because chimpanzees and gorillas are only found in Africa, basically you, you have, um, at least these origin should be in Africa, that would be very strange. And there are two types of chimps, but they are very, rather similar. They are bonobos and pan. And there are two types of gorillas also. So, and of course, these, we are, these are I many of famous fossils that we find in different things. And of course, you can also think that for the, well, another way to you would look at this, somehow look at this spread of these things, and I've spread of humans here. So, here it's quite clear that we are in Africa. But then, if you look at the fossil evidence, actually, it has been, well, nobody got to the Americas before the Homo sapiens. There's no fossil evidence of any. Uh, humans or humanoids before us to be enter Americas. It was quite hard to get there. But we were expansion all over lots of the Asia and Europe, maybe mainly in Asia, but also the, even these earlier found findings in Europe. And actually most of most of the early ones we found basically only in Africa. Some Asia. So so humans has for a couple of million years had a tendency to walk over to expand and find new territories. But of course, this is exceptional. That's what we're doing right now. So if you look at a tree like that, if you look a bit further back, you end up with doing. You have um, well, the gibbons are much further away than the orang and the orangutans are much further away than the gorillas and chimpanzees, and the gibbons are much, much further away. So then that is 40 million years, and this is maybe 12 or that. So it's so these are real outliers, and then you have other monkeys and prosimians, whatever that is. So one for a long time there was a discussion about if you basically go back to this slide. So where did this happen? So and, and was there some kind of mix here, or was it like did it? So where did we origin? So, but basically, and. Out of Africa theory, and there was a multi regional hypothesis. Where you have to idea, we either evolved once, some, but this is a real Homo sapiens sapiens evolved some hundred thousand years ago in Africa and then basically spread out and killed everyone else. There were Homo sapiens in all of a large part of Europe and Asia before, but of course, I mean, they are all extinct now. The alternative theory was that basically it uh, evolved during two million years as a single species, and then there was mixing of these things, and then somehow we all become more or less, more or less uh, uh, distinct. Here. And the key, key concept is actually Neanderthals somehow. Because Neanderthals are the first sites that are most similar to humans living today. 
So if you look at the mitochondrial DNA, so take the mitochondria from uh, uh, people living today, you find a few things. So if you take, um, you try to find it from a um, population that had not mixed very much, you try to, to try to find it from uh, uh, taking, uh, well, native populations in this part of the world and you find then that the variation between Africa's populations is much bigger than the variation between anything else so two one Asian and one Native American and one European are more similar to each other than there are two random Africans so that would be that it basically means that we have lived for a longer time in Africa than we have lived outside Africa. So you can separate one group of this, basically have five groups in Africa somehow that I had in these studies. Um, and this is, uh, so you, can, you, you make it three of these and you can separate the Africans from all, all the others. Well, not the Africans, but you can separate the, uh, basically the yeah, Africa uh, contains everything. There's much more variation in the, within the Africa than there are than anywhere else. So we are a sub part of Africa. So we're all basically Africans. We just recently left there. And you have a routing here that was bad between different, great differences. So you have really uh, different fees. Uh, so the idea would be that you some have something like this. So if you have to do by quantum DNA, is that you have some hundred thousand years ago, you have a population in Africa, and then from fossil evidence, and then you have in the order of 50, 80,000 years ago, maybe you moved away. What do the dots mean there in Africa? So these are just places where they separate, where they took these, uh, these uh, samples. So they are some, some, uh, some tribes living in these places that are kind of s separated from each other. I mean, they try to say people haven't had moved around too much. So they uh, and not been too much influenced. They are, I mean, it's hard to find, I guess, nowadays. But uh, they call they are Yorubans, Western Pygmies, Eastern Pygmies, Hansan, Ikums, whatever. So these are the five different samples. Okay, so then, so this was until a few years ago. This was a kind of this idea to go over and it was was expressed, but uh, we we still had. Uh, the idea is Neanderthals that um, was found in Neanderthal 150 years ago. And they, from fossil evidence, they already lived in, in Europe at least, at least 150,000 years ago. And also West Asia, so lived basically to Ural Mountains and so on, so but a bit, a bit more west. But you didn't find them in East Asia, you didn't find them in Africa, really. Uh, and then they disappeared some 30,000 years ago. So after that you have no evidence. Basically, more or less when the modern human moved there. This seems to be some time period where they both lived there. And you see they are not that different. It's like, I mean, this is, one is Neanderthal, I guess it's Neanderthal, and this is a human, slightly rougher, slightly broader, slightly more stronger, slightly, uh, but it's not a huge anatomical difference, but they clearly are different from the new ones. So, so then people, or particularly one person, set out to sequence this. Um, once we had the sequence techniques, he is a Swedish guy called Svante de Pärbo, who lives, works in Germany, who has a task for many, many years. He worked on sequencing ancient dead. Uh, materials. He took he has sequenced mummies, he has sequenced uh, uh, mammoths and so on. So people try to sequence ancient material. And there are a lot of problems with that. First of all, um, is that the DNA actually is not extremely stable. So the DNA gets uh, broken down during time. So you have short, it's already fragmented quite a lot. Uh, another problem. So there are, also it was not completely random, so there are some biases there and things like that. Another big problem is when you, if you take mammoths, it's not such a bad idea because you, 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 you can sequence it and there's always a risk that you have 
contamination. So basically that someone handling the sample puts their own DNA there. Or some bacteria. There's a lot of bacterial DNA. There's a lot of bacteria living there. Or, or even yeast and fungi living there. But that's also hard. The bacteria and the yeast and fungi are quite different from a mammoth. And the people handling the mammoth DNA is also quite different from... So the humans are quite different from a mammoth. But, but another elephant has a real problem. But for the Neanderthals, the problem is that the Neanderthal genome is extremely similar to us. It's like one base pair in... Uh, 10,000 are the difference, like 99.9% is identical. So you have to be extremely careful uh, to not get your own DNA into the sample. And or not only your own, but also the person who actually picked it up from the uh, from the ground when they found it. I mean, so some, some humans touched it, and we, we always have some DNA on our fingers. So they, they really can draw in the samples. So they, they tried a lot of different samples. They have extremely clean rooms. They have different ways. They always do it twice. There are a lot, lot of practical things. And then they did that. And but finally, so they worked out with it, and they got genomes, actually, they a lot of technical development and things like that. They worked fine. But uh, at, uh, at the end, they managed to get some sequencing. And this is. And they try to compare it to living humans, and there's there are some surprise findings. So and this is kind of a summary of where the model is. So the surprise finding was if you take a Neanderthal sequence, actually I think they took even the original Neanderthal farm. So that was one of the things one they had. Sometimes they didn't know if Neanderthal or not. And you compare it to people, native people mainly, living in different parts of the world. They found that significantly high fraction of the Neanderthal genome was similar to people living outside Africa than in Africa. So, if you took this man, it's not. You took some the average. So, if you took basically, you had basically comparison of Neanderthal and the person in Africa and the people outside Africa. You have much higher chance of. Uh, Right. High fraction of similarities to something someone living outside Africa and in Africa, and of course we know that the, we we assume that the Neanderthals have been in Africa, so that means that some of the DNA from Neanderthals that live has must have been spread to other people. Of course, the expectation was that it could have been here in, in in Europe where the Neanderthals actually was there. So like Europeans would have had a higher fraction of Neanderthals, genes. but you actually find all over. You find in Chinese and in the New Guinea and in the Americas, so also everybody. Outside Africa also had uh, a higher fraction of Neanderthal DNA than Africa had. So clearly, there was a mix of Neanderthals and uh, Homo sapiens, and it probably happened sometime early on where modern humans left Africa, so in the Middle East somewhere. Maybe it happened once, or maybe it have happened. And on the average, it's a couple of percentage of the genome that seems to have an animal or genes. So it's not this huge fraction. Then, so, so that was, I mean, it was a big surprise. The second big surprise was a couple of years later when they found a small uh, bone, well, not there, but the colleagues, in a cave in the Ural Mountains in uh, the North Sea. And they so they sequenced that one, uh, they started to do mitochondrial DNA sequence, and they realized it's not Neanderthal and it's not human. Because they really know, you have a small piece of a bone, you can't say if it's Neanderthal or if it's no more than human, you have no idea. So you sequence it, and you just classify it, and you sort of, is it from a Neanderthal, and it's, be, oh, it's interesting to find Neanderthal up here, but uh, or it's from a human, and it's from a model, because they had age of 50,000 years old or something like that. And then I find a third group, so it's completely outlier. So it's not the Anton of human. So it's somewhere in, well, in between, but it's a third group. So that's and actually then they managed to get a really good DNA sample of this small bone. <coughs> Such a good so they actually could say things like the hair color and the skin color, things like that. So uh, so they have found some genes that are related to skin color. So they have some ideas of how, how this person looked like. But yeah, they only have one small finger there. It was a woman. And then they compare that to people in the world. 
And the surprising thing is that the only place they found similarities is, is to New Guinea. They don't have similarity to, to people living in China or in East Asia today, but they have some similarity. It's mean, actually quite high, if I remember correctly, it's like 6% similarity to people, so some of the tribes, old tribes in New Guinea, not, not the white nations that moved there later, but also some of the really old tribes. So the idea, the explanation they can come up with is basically that these kinds of Denosifans live somewhere in this area, from up here all the way down here to Singapore or whatever, in Thailand, Burma. And somewhere here there was an encounter between the Denosifans and the modern humans that, was, that resulted in an intermix and these people later emigrated down to New Guinea, or this area. So this really provides that ge genomic sequencing, so bioinformatics, a lot of statistics. I mean, this is the signals are quite weak, but you can get signals out there. Can provide new insights into <coughs> our evolutionary history. That is, at least I I find fascinating. So any questions? Lunch time, and then we we'll meet at one o'clock. I should remind you at 2 o'clock there is this welcoming for new students here in this room, if you want to go.